Hi, everybody. Welcome um, to Health for the World's Grand Rounds today. We have a wonderful speaker today, um, all the way from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, so I would like everyone to just introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're all coming and visiting from. Um, and then today we have our speaker, Dr. Claudia Leti. Um, she has done medicine and radiology at the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. She was a neuroradiology research fellow in San Antonio, um, an associate professor at UNC from 2013 to 2014. Um, and at the moment, Dr. Leti is the associate professor at the University of Sao Paulo and chief of research and education at Clinics Hospital of the University of Sao Paulo. Um, so let's give a warm welcome to her. She's going to be giving us a wonderful talk today on CNS infectious diseases imaging findings. Um, and then during her uh, discussion, let's have everybody just uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and we can review them at the end after her um, discussion, okay? All right, so let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Letty. Thank you for the kind introduction. I'm going to talk about the central nervous system infectious disease imaging finding. What we should know. Uh, first, I put a map for you to know where I am. Uh, and let's begin. The roadmap of this uh, a lecture will be. First, I'm going to show a lot of infections that we have in South America, uh, but I'm trying, in a, in a way, trying to be very didactic. I separate the lesions on the spaces, on the meningeal spaces, the complication of the lesions of the meningeal spaces, the parenchymal lesions, and the secondary central nervous system lesions. But we know that in real life, uh, a lot of times the patients have lesions in more than one compartment. Uh, the first, uh, from outside to inside, the first thing that we have is meningitis. Meningitis is not an imaging diagnosis. We know that the diagnosis is done by the CSF, uh, usually by lumbar puncture, but sometimes the clinician needs an imaging if there is a suspicion of intracranial hypertension. In this case, usually they ask for a CT only to see if there are signs of intracranial hypertension. Uh, the agents that cause meningitis are the many types, bacteria, fungi, and virus. Uh, and the findings are very inspecific. You have the same findings for inflammatory, infection, or uh, leptomeningeal carcinomatosis. Uh, the CT is worse than MR, but in both cases, you need the contrast to see the meningeal enhancement. The first case uh, we had on the left, an uh, enhanced T1 weighted image. We can suspect there is some enhancement on this sulci, but if we use the enhanced flare, we could see much better the meningeal compromise. Uh, as I told you, it's completely inespecific. This is the fungi, the cryptococcus, uh, and the cryptococcus uh, can cause a meningitis that's easily diagnosed by the CSF with China Inc. And here we can see the enhancement on the posterior fossa around the cerebellar folia. Another case, this is a histoplasmosis, uh, another fungi. Uh, that's the most common fungi that affects the central nervous system. And here we have a meningeal lesion uh, that looks like an in plaque meningioma. This will be the, the main differential diagnosis, but it's also an infection meningitis. Uh, and as I told you, real life, we don't have only meningitis, especially when we are dealing with images. Uh, and here we have the enhanced flare with a lot of enhancement in the sulci, as well as temporal lobe lesions, bilateral but asymmetric. On T1 weighted imaging, we could see that they present hemorrhage. This is a case of herpes virus type 2. That's uh, also an important meningoencephalitis that we should know. The complications of meningitis are many. And usually we need imaging to do this diagnosis. We have hydrocephalus and pyema. 
vascular complications like vasculitis with or without impacts and venous thrombosis. Uh, I'm going to talk with some agents to explain the findings. The first one that we are going to talk is neurotuberculosis that's caused by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Uh, this is a bacteria that is endemic in some areas of the world, but it had an increased prevalence with HIV. Uh, meningitis can occur. We ca can also see tuberculomas that are granulomas from the mycobacterium as well as abscess. Oh, oh. Mm. Okay, this is a baby uh, with meningitis. We can see the characteristic finding of neurotuberculosis. It's a meningeal enhancement, a thick meningeal enhancement on the basal cisterns. And on this case, we could see also the dilatation of the ventricular system, the third ventricles, the lateral ventricles, due to hydrocephalus. The differential diagnosis of the basal cistern meningitis are sarcoidosis. Uh, another possibility is the presence of collections on the subdural spaces, like we can see on this computed tomography. On this baby, you have uh, the collection as well as meningeal enhancement. Uh, and by computer tomography, we are not able to tell if there is pus or not inside the collection. We will need MR with diffusion to do this differential diagnosis. Uh, only to show the differences, this is a patient that we can see two collections one parasagittal, the other frontal. Uh, the collections on diffusion weighted imaging, they present hyperintensity due to the presence of pus. Uh, that's a very viscous material and restrict the diffusion of water molecules, uh, as well as the compromise of a parenchyma. This is an encephalitis. This then is a meningo encephalitis with subdural collections. On the other hand, we can see collections, subdural collections with the same cyano intensity as the CSF and without enhancement, these are hygromas. Another case on the enhanced flare, maybe we can see very subtle meningeal enhancement. We have obliteration of the posterior part of the atrium of the lateral ventricle, but on diffusion weighted imaging, we can see the ventriculitis there is really content on the posterior part of the ventricles. And we can see also ischemic lesions on the, the encephalon and basal ganglia and insula uh, due to vasculitis with secondary infarcts. Another complication is venous thrombosis that can occur with meningitis. Uh, the appearance of the venous thrombosis is the same as other etiologies. You have a filling defect on the vein or in the uh, sinus. Here we have the transverse and sigmoid sinus uh, thrombosed. Here we can see the thrombo on T2 uh, star images. And the classic uh, delta sign that we can see on the sagittal images. Uh, the infectious disease uh, can affect the ventricular system. We can present ventriculitis, or like in this case, we can present uh, a cyst inside the ventricle. Uh, we can see the wall of the cyst, as well as this mural nodule. The mural nodule uh, is pathognomonic of this disease, neurocystic cercosis, and corresponds to the scolax that's the viable parasite. We published some years ago uh, showing that Fiesta or Keys is a very useful sequence to see the lesion, the cyst wall, as well as the scolex. We also uh, present that diffusion weighted imaging can present restrict diffusion on the scolex. Uh, 
Another possibility of neurocystic sarcosis is the racemose form that you have a bunch of cyst lesions inside the tissues or sulci, enlarging them. Here we have the compromise of both sylvian fissures with or without enhancement. On the corona, we could see also the paracellar region with multiple cysts. Uh, and on surgery, what you have is this a bunch of cysts that uh, you get one and although thing comes out that corresponds to the uh, parasitic cyst. Uh, another possibility is the ventriculitis. We already saw a meningitis with ventriculitis. Here we have a viral case, cytomegalovirus, that is one of the herpes virus family virus uh, that's more common in immunosuppressed patient. And we have the hyperintensity in the ependema, as well as restrict diffusion, but we could not see enhancement, especially on this case. Neurosyphilis is a, another important bacteria, uh, the Treponema pallidum. Unfortunately, its prevalence has been increasing in the wo world. The initial phase, we have meningitis and consequent meningovascular disease. In the late phase, that's year after the infection, we have pubis dorsalis, general paresis, and even dementia. Uh, here is a case in which the patient present is a young patient uh, with an infarct on the left pons. We could also see a small lesion on the superior cerebellum, left cerebellum. And when we did the angel MR, we could see the obstruction of the basilar artery. And the CSF showed the bacteria. Uh, another possibility is the varicella zoster, that's the herpes virus the type three, that can cause in some cases small vessel vasculopathy or desiccating aneurysm. We published this paper also some years ago. Uh, there is lesions on the basal ganglia, and we can see restrict diffusion on the caudate, caudate nucleus, the putamen, and uh, the internal capsule. The angel MR showed a lot of uh, stenotic lesions on the middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, as well as in the posterior circulation. Parenchymal lesions. Uh, the infectious agents can cause a lot of different parenchymal lesions, like encephalitis, necrotic lesions, including the abscess, granulomas, cystic lesions, pseudocyst lesions, as well as demyelination. Let's show some of them. The example of encephalitis is the herpes virus type 2. We already saw one case. Uh, it causes a necrotizing meningoencephalitis, uh, and it's a, a very rapid progression. We have to suspect this diagnosis and install the therapeutics as soon as possible in order to avoid a lot of brain damage. But the PCR sometimes is negative in the first 72 hours. And then we have to suspect and do imaging to do this diagnosis. Usually the lesion is cortical, subcortical, and the location are very characteristic. It involves the temporal lobes, as well as the insula and the basal frontal lobes. Usually the uh, involvement is bilateral, but sometimes uh, it's uh, not symmetrical involvement and uh, you can see or not meningeal enhancement. As in the case that we saw in the beginning of the class, we can have hemorrhage. As I told you, it's very important to suspect of this diagnosis and begin the antiviral drugs to avoid lesions like that, this was a young dentist. She had herpes encephalitis with the sequela of destruction of the both temporal lobes and an important uh, impairment of her memory.
bacterial abscess. Uh, in fact, the abscess has two stages. The first stage, you have the involvement of parenchyma with ill-defined borders uh, and only sometimes a very regular enhancement. After that, you have the host response and the formation of a capsule with central necrosis. And the presentation on is a necrotic lesion with peripheral enhancement. The capsule can present hyperintense on T1, hypointense on T2, the enhancement and central necrosis. And the central necrosis, because of the presence of a pus, present restrict diffusion. If you use the findings of restrict diffusion with hypointense ring in the lesion, there is a high accuracy for uh, abscess. So example, this is the same case that we saw before with meningeal enhancement, the collection, the subdural collection, the frontal collection, and we could see the involvement of the parenchyma with ill-defined borders. On the other hand, the abscess is a necrotic lesion with ring enhancement, necrotic center, and the central portion has restrict diffusion. Another case, this is a classic bacterial abscess. You have the halo of hypointense on T2 with perilesional edema and a necrotic center. The hyperintense halo on T1 with necrotic center restrict diffusion on the central part and ring enhancement after gadolinium administration. Uh, we have also always to think about the differential diagnosis that should be a neoplastic lesion. Neoplastic lesion can have central necrosis, but usually they have a more irregular border. And on diffusion, we don't see restrict diffusion on the central portion in a glioblastoma. We can see restrict diffusion on the borders due to the high cellularity. Uh, uh, tuberculosis can also sometimes become an abscess. Usually the lesion on the parenchyma are granulomas. I'm going to talk a, a little bit later about that. But you, when you have a lot of necrosis, you can have an abscess, like in this case, with peripheral enhancement irregular, central necrosis, perilegial edema, but you don't have pus, and then you don't have restrict diffusion. Fungal abscess. The fungal abscess are usually multiple. Uh, they can present hypointense like a halo or inside the lesion. They have irregular borders, sometimes internal projections and peripheral enhancement. And the diffusion is varied. You can have increase or decrease uh, diffusion. Uh, multiple lesions, you can see that the borders are more irregular, central necrosis, and uh, hypotest ring. And this case, uh, on the center, this is histoplasmosis, on the center had restrict diffusion. Okay. This is a, a fungus that is endemic in South America, it's paracoxidoidomycosis. This fungus usually affects uh, the mediastinum with a lot of lymph nodes, as well as the, uh, uh, the lungs, but rarely it affects the central nervous system. Usually they are multiple lesions, and what we have very characteristic is this intense hypointensity on T2. Uh, on uh, enhanced images, we can see the periphery with irregular borders, some internal projections, the smaller lesion of present ring enhancement, and diffusion, you can see areas of increase and decrease diffusion. Just to see the map, the areas that we have more of this uh, fungi are the South America, this is Brazil, and Central America. Nocardiosis is a fungal that happens usually in diabetic patients. Again, we have multiple lesions with a high low of hypointensity, uh, internal restrict diffusion. And I put this case to show this is a mother lesion or a satellite lesion with the smaller ones. 
This is very suggestive of an infectious process of diverse etiologies. And the parasite can have ne central necrosis on its lesions too. This is a toxoplasmosis with the target sign that's described in 30% of the patients. Uh, you have an heterogeneous lesion can be on the cortical, subcortical region or basal ganglia uh, with peripheral enhancement and you have the target sign on this case. Uh, this is a very rare disease that affects the central nervous system. Chagas disease is a, a, a parasite, the Trypanosoma cruzi, and you have a vector, a mosquito, Triatoma infestum. Uh, it happens on the rural areas of South America, especially they like to live on these houses that are made by mood. Uh, and the Chagas disease rarely involves the central nervous system. Usually it affects uh, the esophagus causing megaesophagus, the uh, bowel uh, causing megacolon, and also the heart. Uh, and as I told you, it's more South American, Central America. Uh, but this patient, he had Chagas disease with a cardiomyopathy and he received a cardiac transplantation. And uh, on the follow-up, he present left hemiparesis. The enhanced CT showed an heterogeneous lesion with enhancement, and the MR showed the lesion that is heterogeneous on uh, flare and peripheral enhancement with a necrotic center. It was an abscess by the trypanosoma cruzi, very rare. Uh, another lesion that happens with infections is granuloma. Granuloma is a definition by pathology. It's an organized aggregate of macrophagus and other immune cells. Uh, and you have this characteristic morphological appearance. Uh, it's really usually a response to a sequestration of an infectious agent or a foreign body. On tuberculosis is the example of granulomas. Usually on tuberculosis, you have a central uh, caseous necrosis that can be microscopic. And when it's so big, you have the abscess. Uh, usually more common, you have multiple lesions with nodular or ring enhancement without restrict diffusion. Only to, because this is the last case of tuberculosis, I'm going to show Tuberculosis can give you meningitis. This is basal cistern meningitis with very uh, uh, pronounced uh, uh, thickening of the meninges. Can cause an abscess very rarely with central necrosis. And tuberculomas that are usually multiple, nodular or ring enhancement lesions. The next case is a cryptococcosis. Uh, this patient came the first examination. We could see some enhancement of the sulci. Uh, as I told you, cryptococcosis, you just have to see the CSF with China ink and you can see the fungi inside it. The patient began with the therapeut, but it didn't, uh, was going well. Repeat the imaging and now we can see parenchymal lesions. Uh, I like the sagittal images that show that these uh, lesions are in the depth of the sulci. They were granulomas that are called cryptococcomas due to the cryptococcus neoformans. Esquistosomias is, is also a disease that affects, uh, in fact, South America, but also Africa and Asia. Uh, in our region, we have the Esquistosoma mansoni. Uh, uh, usually is a disease that affects the uh, gastrointestinal tract and the liver, but sometimes it gets to the central nervous system, usually by the lumbar venous plexus, uh, and affects the low thoracic, lumbar conus medullaris, and sometimes the uh, lumbar sacral roots. On the CSF, you have eosinophilia, and you have two forms, the radicular, and the medullar. In the medullar, we have granulomas that can be, this is the parasite. Uh, usually we, the patient can get stosomias if it goes to swim in lakes that are contaminated by the parasite and also by the intermediate host 
that's a snail. And when the patient goes to this lake to, to swim, uh, usually it eats a lot. Uh, it's the entrance of the parasite. Uh, on the lumbar spine, it can give uh, mass lesions like this one with enlargement of the conus medullaris. And this irregular enhancement is a lot of nodules together. We can see here on the axial imaging. And much, much more rarely, you can have cerebral lesions, like in this patient that you have a lesion that's heterogeneous on T2. And these are like an aggregate of multiple small nodules that we can see after gadolinium and uh, administration. Cystic lesion. Uh, the one example is the that that's uh, caused by the echinococcus granulosus. Uh, the, usually the human being are not on the cycle, are the dogs and the sheep. Uh, but sometimes uh, the man can get uh, infected by its feces and then can present uh, the idatidosis or echinococcosis. Usually this is a single cystic lesion, a big cystic lesion can present or not uh, calcification on its periphery. And usually this cyst does not have the same sinus intensity as the CSF and do not present enhancement. Uh, another disease uh, is neurocystocercosis. Neurocystocercosis is also caused by a parasite. Uh, we have uh, on the parenchyma cystic lesions and we have the mural nodule, that's the scolex, that's the viable parasite. Uh, we can see better uh, on flare images, the scolex. Pseudocyst, you have cryptococcosis. The cryptococcosis can affect either immunocompetent and immunosuppressed patients. Uh, we have shown a case of meningitis, a case of cryptococoma, and this uh, third present form of presentation is the gelatinous pseudocyst. Uh, this lesion uh, comes from the meninges to the uh, perivascular spaces to the parenchyma. Uh, may or may not present enhancement. Usually they have hyperintensity on T2. On flare, they do not have the same sign intensity as the CSF. They have hyperintensity. They do not or may sometimes enhance and do not present restrict diffusion. Only to review the cryptococcosis, what it can cause on the central nervous system, meningitis, cryptococoma, that are granulomas inside the parenchyma, and this gelatinous pseudocyst that comes from the perivascular spaces. Sometimes the infections can cause the medination. The example is progressive multifocal encephalopathy, PML. Uh, that had an increase with the HIV, but also now it has been described for patients with multiple sclerosis using natalizumab. The agent is a JC virus and affects the oligodendrocytes, causing the myelination. As a white matter disease, the lesions are the white matter. Uh, the lesions can extend to the U fibers. Usually the lesions are asymmetric, they can affect the posterior fossa and they do not present enhancement. Uh, sometimes we can see on diffusion weighted imaging, the leading edge of the lesion presenting restricted diffusion. And sometimes after treatment, we can see enhancement of the lesion. Another uh, virus that we have to talk about is the HIV. The HIV usually uh, causes a subtle uh, white matter disease, uh, and the most pronounced uh, finding that we have is the atrophy. The cortical atrophy is very pronounced. In the end, I'm going to, like in real life, we don't have the, the lesion separate. I'm going to talk about neurocystocercosis. We have shown some examples. Uh, it's, uh, as I told you, Central America, South America, Africa, some parts of Middle East and South Asia. Uh, there are two 
forms of uh, parasite that we can get. One is from the meat of the pig, the meat that's not well cooked. Uh, and then you have the oncospheres and you have on this case, uh, a small bowel infection that's teniasis. You have two kinds of teniasis, tenia solium and tenia saginata. But sometimes uh, the man can be infected by the humor or pig feces. And then you, uh, you don't have, you have the eggs and the eggs go to the muscles uh, and the central nervous system. And then we always put this for the uh, medical students because they confound the teniasis with the neurocystic sarcosis. The neurocystic sarcosis come from the vegetables that are not well uh, cleaned, hygienized. Then I have showed you neurocystic sarcosis is a very pleomorphic disease. Uh, we have seen cases in which it affects the subarachnoid space, the ventricular system, but it can affect the brain parenchyma and spinal cord. On the brain parenchyma, you have different stages of the disease, the vesicular, the vesicular colloidal, the nodular, and the calcified. And if we see the scolex, that's this mural nodule on a cystic lesion, this is the viable parasite and is pathognomonic of neurocystic sarcosis. Uh, I'm going, as I told you, in real life, we have more than one lesion. Uh, I'm going first to talk about this lesion, that's the cyst. You have the mural nodule, the scolex. And on the vesicular stage, there is no response of the host to the parasite. There is no perilegial edema, no enhancement. When the host begins to have immunological reaction against the uh, parasite, you have the colloidal, vesicular colloidal form, in which you can have still uh, cystic lesions. Sometimes you see the scolex, but you have perilegial uh, edema as well as peripheral enhancement. The next stage is nodular, then the parasite's not viable anymore. You have a nodular or ring enhancement lesion uh, with, uh, and uh, some perilegional edema. And on central part of the lesion, you can see restrict diffusion as we have shown in a paper some years ago. And the late stage is calcified in which the lesions get calcified and usually they are associated with epilepsy. Only to review all the presentations of neurocystic sarcosis, we can have the racemos form on the sylvian fissures in large or any sulci or any fissure, enlarging them. Uh, we can have the intraventricular form in which you have the cyst and the scolex. You can have the vesicular form in which you have a cyst, the scolex, and no response of the host, no enhancement, no perilegional edema. When you have perilegional edema and enhancement, you have the vesicular colloidal or colloidal uh, form. You have the nodular with nodular or uh, peripheral ring enhancement, and you have the calcified form. Uh, and another lesion that, uh, to show that real life, you have more than one lesion, we have toxoplasmosis, toxoplasma gondii. Uh, it affects usually immunosuppressed patients, affects the basal ganglia, the cortical subcortical junction, and the thalami. And usually you have multiple lesions. Uh, the lesions with necrosis are described with this target sign. And usually they have or peripheral or nodular enhancement. Here you have a case uh, with multiple lesions, some in the basal ganglia, some in the cortical, subcortical junction. Uh, sometimes, even without any treatment, the lesions present hyperintensity that does not correspond to hemorrhage on the gradient or SWI imaging. Some of them can present uh, perilegional edema, some do not, and they can have nodular as well as peripheral enhancement. 
uh, the lesions, some have a frank necrotic center, the others not. Uh, for the last part, I'm going to talk about secondary central nervous system involvement. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of COVID-19. Uh, I know nobody can stand COVID anymore, but we have to talk about it. I'm not going to give a lot of detail of the infection. We don't need that. Uh, and I'm going, the virus is not proven that it really has effect on the parenchyma, but it has secondary effect on the central nervous system by uh, the formation of thrombi, uh, giving infarcts, like in this case, that you have an infarct on the middle cerebral artery in a 43 years old patient, as well as uh, posterior. Uh, arterial system, uh, basilar artery uh, and vertebral artery um, infarct. And an even younger patient that uh, had hemorrhage, diffuse hemorrhage, including intraventricular hemorrhage in a very catastrophic case. Both of those patients uh, uh, died. Another disease that we have, we have here in the tropical area is dengue. Dengue is also a virus. Uh, and uh, there is a vector that's a mosquito, the Aedes aegypti. Uh, and this disease usually do not affect the central nervous system, except when it causes the decrease of the platelets so intense that we can have uh, brain hemorrhage. This patient had dengue with IgM positive. On the first examination, we could not uh, really see the hemorrhage, but the next day it got worse and went to MR. It, we could see clearly the extensive hemorrhage throughout the basal ganglia bilaterally. What are the take home messages? Uh, we have to understand at least the mechanisms of the involvement of the central nervous system infections to try to recognize them. Uh, and we have to know that in real world, world we don't have the lesions separate. Uh, the other thing that we have to know is that some infectious agents, they have characteristic imaging findings and these imaging findings help us to narrow the diagnosis. Uh, the best example is neurocysticercosis. When you have a cystic lesion with the neural nodule, this is neurocysticercosis. I would like to thank for my colleagues uh, that helped me to prepare this lecture and thank you all for the attention. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, so let's review our question. We have one uh, from an anonymous person. Let's see. It says, can we always uh, be able to diagnose the etiology of neural infection by imaging alone as most infection present as meningitis or abscess? That's our first answer question. Most, most, of, the, uh, most of the time we cannot because they are in a specific findings. Uh, we, uh, even, uh, for example, for the abscess that you have restrict diffusion, there is exception. You have some mucinous metastasis from colon that can present restrict diffusion on the central part. And the meningitis, uh, per se, you can have meningitis, uh, carcinomatous meningitis with the same presentation as a fungal meningitis, a viral meningitis, a bacterial meningitis. They are not specific at all, uh, but you, uh, and it, it's important to know that sometimes the patient that have infectious disease on the central nervous system does not present fever. When it presents fevers, it's easy. Oh, we are going to suspect by infectious disease, but most of the time the patient does not present seizures. A seizure, no, fever, sorry. Excellent. Um, the next question is going to be from Enrique Menario. Uh, do you prefer to use CT or MRI for infections? Uh, usually the patient go, uh, MR is better, but we know that this is not uh, the real situation. 
uh, a lot of times the patients goes to a hospital that only have computer tomography, uh, and then we have to do the diagnosis by computer tomography. Uh, of course, it's better to have CT, uh, MR, uh, enhanced MR than enhanced CT, but many times we don't have the situation and we have to look for the findings on MR, on CT, sorry. Okay. Um, the next question is how to best differentiate abscess with glioblastoma? Yeah, uh, the abscess, uh, if they have the viscous material inside, they have this restrict diffusion on its internal part. Uh, on the other hand, if you are looking for a tumor, the tumor does not has, has a fluid inside it. Uh, the necrosis is not uh, uh, viscous, it's a very fluid uh, material, and then does not present restrict diffusion. Sometimes you can see uh, some restrict areas of diffusion on the wall of the necrosis that's uh, due to the hypercellularity of the tumor. Mm. Okay. Um, next question, is there any role for PET-CT in the diagnosis of CNS infection? Uh, in the past, they used uh, gallium for this, but nowadays they do not use anymore. Uh, for the infections on the central nervous system, uh, PET is not a, a, a good diagnostic tool. All right, and those were all our questions. Um, thank you for everyone who joined in. Let's see who joined in with us today. Um, we had Jay from Sri Lanka. We had uh, Enrique from Mexico. Um, Erwam, Dr. Udin from Ghana. We had Jorge Muniz from Miami, Florida. Gladys from Nicaragua. We had Esni all from Mexico. Um, we had uh, Mr. Bhutan from, where is that? Oh, sorry, Dr. Mr. Chuck from Bhutan. And then we had our uh, radiologist, Ahesh uh, Ranchad from Johannesburg, South Africa. Perla from Mexico. Maria, also from uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, and then Jay from Sri Lanka. So, uh, and then also from the Philippines. Yeah. So, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Dr. Letty, so much for that wonderful talk. Um, so this concludes our grand rounds for today. Um, we'll see thank you next time. Thank you all for the attention. Thank you. Thank you.